This episode brought to you by Mint Mobile, the first company to sell wireless services online only. Also brought to you by Freshly. Stop stressing about dinner and have it delivered right to your home today. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the outcast, the creepy and depraved, the bizarre creations not meant for the normal world. Embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! Like many of you, there were movies my parents didn't let me see when I was younger. Usually due to violence, sex, language, all the good stuff we grow up to love later. But it was very rare I couldn't see a movie because I was told it was just too stupid. One was Garbage Pail Kids, which, okay, I'm very thankful my parents didn't let me see that. Another was Hot to Trot, which, okay, it wouldn't have harmed my mind, but it was dumb. And the other was Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. Now let me make this clear, I am a huge Monty Python fan. I saw practically every Monty Python thing up to that point. I watched the show, heard the recordings, saw their concerts. I even played their Waste of Time games that literally advertised they were a waste of time. So the idea of missing out on one of their movies, hell, their last movie, drove me absolutely insane. I would see pictures and hear some of the songs, but was never allowed to see it because it was deemed too stupid to check out. Which obviously made me want to see it more. Well, finally, when I got old enough, I went to the video store, rented it myself, and... This is one of those movies where even to this day, I don't know what to think about it. Over the years, I found many people were all over the map as well. Some love it, some hate it, some are in the middle. Out of all their movies that weren't just ones where they were redoing their sketches, this one seemed to be the black sheep. And even if you enjoyed the film, you can still clearly see why. Their previous films, Holy Grail and Life of Brian, were low-budget period pieces with a linear story that often mocked one subject. Meaning of Life talked about a variety of subjects with no connecting story in modern day on their biggest budget. On top of that, even though the other films could get both weird and gross, this was no doubt the weirdest and grossest out of all of them. So even if you love the film, you can still acknowledge it's clearly different from the other two. But that still raises the question, is it a good movie or not? Though they sometimes sparked outrage when they first came out, the previous movies are now often regarded as comedic masterpieces, being quoted, reinterpreted, and sold all over the world. Meaning of Life, on the other hand, doesn't quite get as much love. I don't exactly hear a lot of people quoting it or rushing out to get merchandise of it. But that's not to say people don't talk about it at all or have a fondness for it. It got the grand jury prize at Cannes, critics and audiences seemed to accept it okay at the time, but most agreed it just didn't have the same magic as the other two. But just because it's not as good as its predecessors doesn't mean it's bad, right? I don't know. Let's take a look. The film opens with a short that many say is actually the funniest part of the movie. The Crimson Permanent Assurance is about a group of old men working for an assurance company that clearly doesn't value them. They fight back and overthrow their corporate overlords, similar to a ship mutiny, and attack the higher-ups just like a pirate picture. At first I found this intro funny, but not really connecting that much with the rest of the movie, aside from a throwaway joke in the middle of the film. I found out, though, that this was supposed to be an animated section in the film, but it just grew so big they wanted to make it live-action and give it its own separate presentation before the movie started. Looking back, ironically enough, I think this actually would have fit in the film fine as it is about people at the later stages of their lives fighting back against those who toss them aside. It does surprisingly tie into the stages of life they discuss in the movie. Regardless of wherever they put it, it's still entertaining. The official film opens with an impressive effect that, while not keyed out that great, shows a lot of creativity and ingenuity. It's just a bunch of fish, often seen as rather low on life's totem pole, looking over one of their friends being eaten and wondering what the meaning of life is. Makes you think, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, what's it all about? I like that something small and seemingly insignificant seems to get the ball rolling here. This leads to the opening song and animation showing all the traditional, even cliched attributes that many say leads to a good life. Sex, marriage, a house, family, job, and all of it drawn to look like threatening accomplishments. I especially love this creature at the top of a building of file cabinets like King Kong. It's made up from images of traditional life goals that we've been told are normal, laundry, offspring, a nice ring, wallpaper. This monster alone is kind of a good sum up of the film. It's really smart and clever, but only when you examine it for a long while. It doesn't exactly get a laugh right away. Part one. The Miracle of Birth. The film is then separated in parts, beginning with The Miracle of Birth. 
A bunch of kooky doctors take pride in their work, congratulating themselves on their high-tech equipment while treating the patient like absolute shit. Bring it out of here. Find the machine! Sorry. Watching it again, the strengths and weaknesses of the film are surprisingly made clear early on. The ideas are really good. Whether it's deep, light, silly, thought-provoking, gross, clean, whatever, every idea in this has promise that does tie into the meaning of life. But there's one important comedic element that's off. Timing! As someone has driven punchlines into the ground, yes, timing is important. Though there's many different forms of comedy, a lot of people agree the best kind of humor is usually fast humor. Now, that's not at all to say slow humor can't be great. Andy Kaufman was a master of this. Norm Macdonald has made a hilariously uncomfortable career out of it. Even those 10-hour videos, despite if we don't plan on watching it all, still wouldn't be as funny if it wasn't actually 10 hours. But there's probably more cases of slow humor not holding up. When Family Guy and SNL would drag something out, many loved how it pushed the envelope of how long a bit could go. Now, years later, though, it simply isn't as impressive. Where faster comedy, like say from Duckman, Rick and Morty, or Edgar Wright movies, are aging great because people are taking in information faster and therefore like their comedy faster. As someone who spent years doing both fast and slow humor, I can tell you, the fast humor usually ages better. On that note, this scene clearly wants a lot of energy and spark to it, but the pacing is just a hint too slow. What's that for? That's the machine that goes bing! <laughs> You see, that means your baby is still alive. A boy or a girl? Now, I think it's a little early to start imposing roles on it, don't you? Let's watch that again, but this time with some faster editing. What's that for? That's the machine that goes bing. You see, that means your baby is still alive. A boy or a girl? I think it's a little early to start imposing roles on it, don't you? See how it comes to life a little bit more? If this scene was meant to be slower, it could work, but I really think it was trying to get across this fast-paced energy that wasn't quite there. But not every bit is supposed to work like that. In one of the film's most famous sequences, a family has to sell off their children to medical experiments because they don't believe in birth control. God has blessed us so much, I can't afford to feed you anymore. This leads to a big musical number, most likely satirizing song sequences like Oliver. The point it's trying to make is very clear, and on top of that, it's done in the most perfect way. This needed to be a big song sequence that went all out in order to get a laugh. And even though I said this one isn't quoted nearly as much as the previous films, there isn't a person who's seen this who doesn't remember, every sperm is sacred. Every sperm is sacred. This is followed by one of my favorite visuals in the film, a family of a different faith talking about how much better their religion is while they watch countless children sent to the slaughter. Most of it is done in one long shot, so they had to plan all these children walking to their doom while they discuss how superior their faith is. Doing most of it in one shot emphasizes the joke of how many there are and how heartless this couple is for ignoring or even mocking them. That's why it's the church for anyone who respects the individual. Continuing their satire of both religion and childhood, we cut to a religious school where they spend most of their time being literal God-fearing followers. Praising his word, not because they believe in it, but because they don't want to get smoted by him. Oh Lord, please don't burn us, don't kill or toast your flock. It's followed by another great idea that, in my opinion, could have been trimmed down quite a bit. It's a satire of, I think, sex education in school where the teacher goes into great detail to the point where he makes love to his wife after transforming the chalkboard into a bed. God, that's funny. But the children aren't interested because, well, kids never care about what adults have to say, especially in school. Carter, what is it? It's an ocarina, sir. Bring it up here. I feel like this could have been summed up in a minute or two, but it goes on for seven. And again, there's a lot of awkward silences in it. Foreplay is Biggs. Um, don't know, sorry, sir. It does end with a funny punishment where the kids are sent out to play rugby with students double their size. Half the time they're not even playing, they're just beating each other because they can. <laughs> and I really like this cut where it goes from young people in school to young people at war. Almost like that's the natural progression of what's next in life. I don't know if that's intentional, but I do find it an interesting edit. Part 3. 
fighting each other. The next part is about war, as we see a battlefield where one of those motivational speeches you see all the time in the movies goes too far when the soldiers become so emotional they keep giving presents to their commander, interrupting their rush towards the enemy. I say forget it, man. Let's not give him the cake. Black it got especially for you, you bastard. Yeah, he saved his rations for six weeks, sir. That's a cute bit, and I really do like the follow-up where a sergeant is asking his soldiers if they can think of anything better to do than training for battle. Every time someone suggests something, he tells them to go do it. I've got a book I'd quite like to read. Right, you go read your book then. I don't know if there's a ton of commentary to these scenes, but they do make me laugh. Plus, it does lead to maybe the most quoted line in the movie. And may God strike me down were it to be otherwise. Don't stand there, Corbin! Oh, you've never seen the hand of God before! At least I think it's the most quoted. God strike me down with a sponsorship if I'm wrong. My God, Houston, it's amazing. What? What do you see? Something as phenomenal as Mint Mobile. That doesn't help me. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. Still not helping. So when I heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? Why don't you just tell me what you see? But after speaking with them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. What are you talking about? Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. Secret Sauce? What? By cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead cost that gets passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings direct to you. Just tell me what you see. You spent years training for this. I'm looking at extra savings. What? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Why do I need to know Use this? your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% Satisfy Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven day money back guarantee. Well, great for Mint Mobile. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks you a month. You said that like three times! To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month Four. and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. That's mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month Five. at mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. Oh wow, Jerry, you won't believe what? it. Do you see something different? Totally different. Well, tell me about it's it. like feeling stressed, tired and just not feeling like cooking. What are you talking? Food that's fast doesn't have to be fast food. Freshly offers what? quality what? meals without the hard what? work of prepping, cooking, and cleaning. Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. No cooking it looks required. Like freshly? What does that Freshly mean? shopping and cooking can be a pain, especially right now, and with Freshly, you don't have to. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week, so you can keep the fridge stocked and skip the trip to the store. This is the worst day of my Ordering life. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose from over 30 delicious, satisfying, Buying better for you meals like steak peppercorn, sausage baked panne, or their chicken pesto bowl. Gee, tell me more. I see clouds what? that look like potatoes you can get with Freshly. Freshly can fit your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Hooray. And now our viewers can try Freshly for just $6.16 per meal. Stop searching the internet for healthy food near me every night and start living life freshly. When you get back to Earth, you're fine. Your meals are always delivered fresh, never frozen, and are ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. With new meals added each week, Freshly brings the convenience of chef-made nutritionist design classics right to your kitchen. Right now, Freshly is offering our viewers $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash nostalgia. Stop stressing about dinner and go to Freshly.com slash nostalgia for $40 off your first two orders. Anything else? That's Freshly.com slash nostalgia for $40 off your first two orders. I'm never humaning again. We cut to the Zulu War, which I never noticed as a cameo from Michael Caine as he was in the film Zulu. Impossibly a mockery of classism where tons of soldiers are being slaughtered, but the higher-up's concern is one of them lost a leg. And he doesn't even seem that bothered by it. Woke up just now? One sock too many. I feel like this would have been a little funnier if it was like a bee sting or something smaller like that. But I guess I do respect that they're trying a couple different types of jokes to make it a little stranger. One of the officers has lost a leg. Oh, no, sir! I'm afraid so. Plus, this legit kills me. Making up a search party. Oh. Better than staying at home, isn't it, sir? It gets stranger when we come across two men posing as a tiger, and we never get a reason why. There's a pro czarist Ashanti chief. No, uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 we're doing it for an advertisement. This is another one of those scenes where I can't decide if it's brilliant that we never find out, or if the build-up to nothing goes on forever. Either way, I love how committed these two are. 
playing it like if anyone found out the real reason, it would be the absolute worst thing that could happen. Making the mystery even more fascinating. He had an auntie who did it in 1839, and this is the 50th anniversary. No, we're doing it for a bet. God told us to do it. To tell the truth, we are completely mad. Oh. We then cut to the middle of the film. Yes, that is actually how they refer to it. Hello and welcome to the middle of the film. Where they ask you to play a game called Find the Fish. This is the strangest part of the movie. You looked after it like a son. And it went with an eye. It didn't go. Wouldn't you like to know? Strangest interpretation of Finding Nemo ever. First off, I'm pretty sure there's no fish to find. Second, this is just surreal for the sake of being surreal. It's like those segues in Flying Circus that don't always make sense, but they create a fun and strange environment. I guess this does the same thing, but... I know this is gonna sound hypocritical. I think it's a little too short. It's only a minute long, and if you're gonna go full strange, dive all the way into it. Give us a Pink Elephants, an Epilumps and Woozles, a Beavis and Butthead Do America music video. This is just a room with some strange stuff, and then it's gone. It's not quick enough to get a laugh like the X-Men cameo in Deadpool 2, but it's also not long enough to feel like we went through a surreal experience. It just kind of comes and goes, but... I guess I do remember it, and what I remember was certainly strange. Which is probably more than I can say for this next chunk. We get to middle age, where the fish, maybe we were supposed to spot, I don't know, bring up that there's not much talk about the meaning of life. They haven't said much about the meaning of life so far, have they? This leads to, again, maybe a few too many jokes on top of each other, where a couple are at a theme resort where the theme happens to be a dungeon. But they act like it's a Hawaiian luau. They want to be so accommodating, they not only give them menus, but also conversations to talk about. Including the meaning of life. You ever wanted to know what it's all about? Nope. No. Right ho The conversations go nowhere, and ultimately so does the sketch. Again though, if you really pick it apart, there are some funny things. First off, their American accents just crack me the fuck up. Would you care for something to talk about? Oh, that would be wonderful. Our special tonight is minorities. Oh, that sounds real interesting. I think an American hearing this is similar to a Brit hearing Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins for the first time. It's kind of amazing. But second, there is something to be said that both something and nothing is being said. Yeah, that made a lot of sense. What I mean is, they're not talking about the meaning of life in a way that's straightforward, but a lot of the conversations and ideas do seem centered around it just in a very silly and satirical way. The next part, for example, is two people taking a man's liver because his card said he's an organ donor. Nobody seems to mind, apart from the man using his liver at the moment. And when his wife is asked if she wants to give up hers, it suddenly jumps to this song sequence about how vast the universe is. The universe itself keeps on expanding and expanding. This really is a charming and even poignant song about how insignificant we really are. But it's for something as silly as letting people steal your liver. The whole movie seems in battle with itself for having great meaning and no meaning at the same time. I suppose that could be the idea, as everyone would look at a film about life and see something different the same way people can look at life itself and see something different. Which is the perfect segue to the sketch people seem to be the most divided about. The Mr. Creosote sketch! How are we today? Better. Better? Better get a bucket or a throw up. People either hate or laugh their asses off at this section, and honestly, I understand both. It's just a huge guy who walks into a fancy restaurant and pukes on everyone. That's it. It's too simple to say, oh, it's just gross out humor, so it's petty and beneath us, as, first of all, some of the great comedy of the time has incorporated gross out humor. And second, I think the intro sets it up well. This piano player sings a song about his dick. Doesn't it all be nice to have a penis? Isn't it frightfully good to have a dong? But because it's an upscale restaurant, everybody sees it as daring and risque. Oh, what a frightfully witchy song. If you keep that mindset, this routine is actually pretty clever. As because this guy has money and clearly comes to the restaurant a lot, they'll just let him do whatever he wants. And nobody complains. I guess so. A bucket for monsieur. I also like the other rich people will make up these insane excuses as to why they don't want to be there as opposed to say it's because there's this wealthy, disgusting guy. I'm having rather a heavy period. We have a train to catch, and I don't want to start bleeding all over the seats. 
Does it go on too long? In my opinion, yeah, but the 10-year-old in me does legit love the precise timing of the projectile vomit. Order straight away. <laughs> We next cut to one of the waiters bringing you a rather long way to show you what he thinks the meaning of life is. You see that? That's where I was born. He shows off the building of where he was born and explains how his mother taught him to bring peace and joy wherever he went. So he became a waiter. He then realizes it sounds kind of lame and attacks the viewer for listening to him. Well, fuck you. Fuck off. I really love this moment because it's built up perfectly. It's done with a side character from another sketch, so he does feel like an unassuming presence. It makes you think it's really gonna go sentimental. And then it goes from being really simple and sweet to cynical and angry in a millisecond. I really love how he comes up with what many would consider the meaning of life and then just destroys it immediately after. A part of me actually wanted the movie to end right here. Don't come following me. Just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving. Instead, we get the last portion of the film, Death. This is a collection of sketches that are... fine. One is a guy who gets to choose how he dies, so he picks being chased by naked women jumping off a cliff. The next is an animation of leaves committing suicide as they change color and fall to the ground. The final is the Grim Reaper trying to take a group of people to the afterlife, but they can't stop yammering long enough to let him explain. Be quiet! Can I just say this at this time, please? Silence! They're paced fairly well and get some laughs. They just feel like something more out of a TV show than an actual movie. They work well enough, though. If for any other reason, just hearing Death say balls is pretty funny. None of you have got any balls. They take the ghosts of their cars to drive to heaven, again, a really great visual, and find all the characters in the movie listening to Grant Chapman's best Jeff Goldblum impression. And I'd like to sing a song for all of you. Sorry, American impressions really are the funniest thing to me. <laughs> they sing a lovably tacky song called Christmas in Heaven, and we're finally given the incredibly underwhelming meaning of life. Well, it's nothing very special. I try and be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in, and try and live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations. I do really love that the most generic thing you can imagine is the answer. It's not mind-blowing at all. The whole film has that vibe that it's both really important and not important in the slightest. Which again, I'm really thinking might be intentional. The final image is a TV playing Monty Python's Flying Circus floating into space as the credits roll. Again, it doesn't really match the endings of the other films, but seeing how this would be their last movie together, there is something sentimental about it. And that is easily the weirdest Monty Python movie ever made. Is it any good? It kind of depends. If you like good ideas that are presented in a trollish type way, I think you'll get your money's worth. If you're looking for something that has a clear focus and rapid fire humor, it's not that. I can't act like this is my favorite of their films, but I will admit every time I see it, it does get me thinking. With the other films, it's very clear what they're trying to get across. It's also very clear when it's supposed to be clever satire, childish silliness, or a combination of both. With this, it's not quite as spelled out. Which means some can leave feeling empty and cheated, but others can get a conversation going about what certain moments in the film were trying to say. If anything at all. I think I'd probably respect it more than I like it. I do really admire the variety of jokes and strange ways they try to present their material. I think there's always going to be a small part of me that does really enjoy this. Even if I don't put it on as much as the other ones. But enough about me, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's an underrated gem, a missed opportunity, or something different altogether? Let me know in the comments down below and remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving. Revolving at 900 miles an hour. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it so you don't have to. So it's reckoned... To tell the truth, we are completely mad. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out, and I'm sorry to say I got sick again recently. I, I got better really fast, but it did kind of put things uh, 
uh, on the back burner and push things back a bit. So I, this is the last thing I usually do before I put the video out, so I haven't had a chance to look up another charity. So I'm just doing one, again, that we've done a couple times, but it, it's a phenomenal charity. You know it. It's uh, the Red Cross. Uh, you can go to their site. You can uh, see if you can donate. It's also a wonderful charity that you can use to uh, volunteer at. I mean, they're always looking for uh, volunteers, donations. It, you've heard of them. You know the amazing stuff that they do. So please definitely check them out. I'm sorry I couldn't introduce a new one this week, uh, but uh, I will definitely get one to you next week. But until then, check out Red Cross if you haven't already. Look at all the amazing things they do on their site. Uh, they're really a phenomenal organization. So check them out and I'll see you next time.